This topic is very close to my heart, and what I'm going to present to you tonight is the product of work that I've been involved in for about two decades. Uh, so we will talk a little bit about the ways in which science sheds light on consciousness and how consciousness really sheds light on science and that there is this co-evolving process by which we are engaged in our human unfolding. I think all of us know that we are alive at an extraordinary time in human history. Never before have so many worldviews, belief systems, ways of engaging reality come into contact. On the one hand, we have the extraordinary successes of Western science. We have an orbiting space station, we have a Mars rover and an expedition going to Mars and beyond. We have the Human Genome Project. Uh, we have so many advances in terms of technology and our ability to connect. And at the same time, we now know more from the world's wisdom traditions than ever before. With just a simple stroke of a keyboard, we can gain access to sacred knowledge that was once the exclusive insight of a group of adepts somewhere in the Himalayas or deep in the Amazon. And today, we now have the opportunity to weave these different truth systems together. We know that prophecies are something that predicts the future. Science has been part of that process for the last 300 years, and often uh, failing miserably. So rather than talk about prophecy, it's more about hypotheses. Uh, scientists are very interested in asking questions and discovering and engaging. And while some have hubris and uh, feel that they have the answers, I think that the great opportunity of science converging with the wisdom traditions is that we have more questions than ever before. And so this is a delight for all of us. In this time, we are bombarded by information. We have uh, snail mail, voicemail, and email, and we have Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. All of these things are coming at us at a rapid pace. We know that we now get more information in the course of a day than we have in the entire history of civilization. So if anybody's feeling a little overwhelmed, there's very good reason for it. We are really in an overwhelming time. And at the same moment, we have this opportunity to be here together in these moments of celebration, in these moments of contemplation, where we can really begin to turn our attention to our inner experiences. Okay, so in the context of this talk, I want to ask three questions. First, how do we manage such complexity? What are the skills and capacities that are needed as we reach into the 21st century and face all of these multiple complexities? And how can we move from coping with overwhelm to flourishing in the midst of the opportunities that face us? I live in Silicon Valley, and I can tell you that this isn't just funny. <laughs> it's actually a statement of our times and the experiences of our culture and our worldview. There is really a sense that these kind of internal navigation systems are often not what we intend them to be. People forget that we come with this sense of purpose and with meaning, and that in that process, it can give us an opening to the virtues and the, the ways in which we can help one another to cultivate peace. So the work that I'm talking about began when I was at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And I want to tell you just a little bit about the history of how this came about. I um, was working one day in my office, and a gentleman came, thank you, and uh, he was a very no-nonsense businessman. His name was Richard Gunther, and he had had an epiphany, basically an enlightened moment, and he felt that as a businessman, as um, somebody who had a very deep commitment to his community, to his family, uh, that perhaps what he experienced when he looked out at the Pacific Ocean and had this unitive consciousness moment was something that could be life-changing. It certainly was for him. And so he came to me with the idea that he wanted to answer two questions. One is, 
is this experience he had something that other people have had? And if so, is it something that we can learn about and we can teach and we can help people to open to their sense of entanglement and engagement? Well, we did look into the literature quite heavily, and at that time, in the scientific and medical literature, these kinds of unitive experiences were largely, largely considered to be delusional or psychotic. And yet, when you looked at the experience that Richard Gunther had, there was nothing delusional about it. In fact, it had changed his life in such a way that he became a great philanthropist, and he dedicated a great deal of his time to giving back to society. The reason he came to the Institute of Noetic Sciences is because of the founding uh, of the organization. And that came from the Apollo space mission and Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell was one of the Apollo 14 astronauts who had the opportunity to walk on the moon. His part of the mission was to um, to steer clear the small capsule that went from the Apollo space capsule to the moon and back. And so after his historic walk on the moon, he describes having the window seat on the way home. And so he was looking out the window, and as the Apollo capsule came back into the Earth's gravitational field, they did what they called the barbecue rotation. They came into the Earth's atmosphere atmosphere by circling so that they didn't burn up on re-entry. And in that process, he was able to watch the sun, the moon, and the earth rise and set and rise and set. And he looked down at planet earth in the vastness of space, in all its pristine wonder and beauty, and he felt this overwhelming sense of suffering. He looked down at this beautiful planet and he saw no divisions. There were no national boundaries, state boundaries, race boundaries, religious boundaries, gender boundaries. None of that existed. And he wondered, how is it that we experience such suffering on planet Earth? And where does that come from if it's not inherent in planet Earth itself? And he realized that it comes from within us. It comes from our own consciousness and that it's a worldview issue that leads to the suffering that so many people experience on a daily basis. The second aspect of his experience, looking out in the vastness of space, was this idea of interconnectedness. It was essentially the same experience Richard Gunther had had, and which many of you have probably had, where there is this oneness, and he felt that the molecules in his body connected him with the molecules of the whole solar system, and that he was part of the original Big Bang, and that his colleagues there in the Apollo capsule shared something with him that was part of the essence of the foundation of our being, and that there was no separation between them. So in this moment of epiphany, he recognized that perhaps the great frontier wasn't outer space, which is what the Apollo program and all of our space ex explorations are geared toward, but really the nature of inner space. And how could we begin to reconcile that the kind of experiences that we have in order to make peace, in order to manifest the essence of our human potentials, really comes from understanding who we are and what we're capable of becoming. And as a scientist, as an MIT engineer, he brought with him the rigor and discernment that came from science to begin to ask new questions about the nature of our experience. Okay. So we began this project really trying to systematically understand the nature of Ah, it's working, thank you, it's working. <laughs> uh, and the beauty and the wonder of the, the living systems on this planet. And so we began this process of really trying to understand what is a worldview? What is this lens of perception that influences absolutely everything that we experience? Where does that come from? And how can it transform? How is it that there is this perception 
John talked about it last night, that it's all about our perceptions. And our worldviews are conditioned by various aspects of our upbringing, our society, uh, the books we read, the podcasts we listen to. Um, how is it that we can become aware of that which we are not aware of? And that becomes an important challenge for our study of consciousness because so much of it is implicit and beyond the level of our consciousness, our conscious awareness. So this idea of a worldview transformation involves these profound shifts in consciousness resulting in long-lasting changes in the way we experience and relate to ourselves, others, and the world. And as we're talking about in this symposium, it's also about the nature of our relationship to the outer world. So how is it that each of us, in the process of our own worldview transformation, pe can begin to seed these ideas into the broader society? So when we talk about consciousness transformation, it's not all good. And we can certainly read the newspapers, listen to the news, and see that there's a lot of evil. There are a lot of ways in which people, social groups, uh, systems of belief attempt to do things that are ultimately not life-affirming. And so we wanted to think about Nazi Germany, Jonestown, Al-Qaeda. Um, how are these systems different than the kinds of worldview transformation we were seeking? How is it that we can begin to recognize that it's a slippery slope to begin to engage in something that ultimately can lead us to tragedy rather than to this idea of opportunity. So in this idea of negative transformation, mass killing was the unyielding fact of life to which everyone is, was expected to adapt. So in Nazi Germany, many people didn't even notice what was happening to them. Many people, when they go through Al-Qaeda and the Madras educational system, especially when they're very young, don't know that they're being inculcated into a particular belief system. So this requires discipline. It requires practice. It requires the kind of focus that we're engaged in here. So this positive transformation is a perspective on life that promotes greater depth, meaning, pro-social engagement, and resilience in the face of change. And again, as John mentioned last night, we can choose. Do we choose to go one path or the other? And these are issues that we are capable of dr grappling with every day in our lives. So as we started to do research, we were interested in this topic of positive transformation. What predicts it? What are the outcomes when people engage in positive transformation practices? What are the moderators? On whom, under what circumstances, can we invite in these positive changes in our life? And how and why do they occur? So we did a number of things, and I don't expect you at the back of the room to read this, so I will help you. Um, what we did in the course of this two decades is to begin by asking people to tell us their stories. Have you ever had a transformative experience? And if you have, what triggered it? What sustained it? And where did it lead you? And we got thousands of letters, narratives from people describing their life journey. And often they talked about it as though it was the hero's journey. There was life before and there was life after this kind of opening, this revelatory experience. We then began to talk to masters of different traditions. We convened three focus groups with people who believed they could teach transformation. And we invited them to come and share with each other to help us identify the most salient questions that we could ask. And it was very interesting how much pain was expressed amongst that group. Even the teachers of transformation were lonely. Even the teachers of transformation had gone through very painful experiences in order to begin to recognize there was something more in their life, in their destiny. 
So I'll go back to this. So that led us to formulating a set of questions that we went around and very systematically asked 60 masters from different traditions. And what this diagram represents is you know, essentially the kind of groups that we were talking with, the kinds of disciplines that people were drawing from. There were the Western Christian traditions, Catholicism, uh, evangelical Christians, um, we looked at Lutherans, Episcopals. And then over here on the eastern side, we were looking at Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, uh, Judaism, and then the ancient indigenous traditions, where, again, we've heard about this at some length, where we were talking to people who had come from the first world nations, who had experienced this sense of coherence between their worldview and that sense of the sacred. There was no separation. And what you see in the middle are traditions that grew up largely in Northern California and that were spurred by uh, the 60s, the early 70s, when people were inviting a kind of challenge to our assumptions and a questioning of authority, and oftentimes moving towards spiritual practices rather than religious practices. These were things like Stan Groff's holotropic breathwork or Angeles Arian's fivefold path or um, we talked to Michael Harner about some of his shamanic work that provided a bridge between the ancient indigenous and the modern community. So in all of this, then, we compiled um, a team who came together, helped us to analyze the data. Every one of the 60 interviews was transcribed, was reviewed by uh, trained participants, and we asked them to code line by line what were these teachers telling us about what promotes transformation, what sustains it, and how do we live more fully engaged in life as a result of it. And this culminated in the book and the DVD of Practices. So this is just a very simple experiment that I thought we'd do that uh, allows us to uh, experience what is worldview transformation. So I invite you to just, if you feel like it, put your finger up in the air and watch it. Okay, so look at your finger and then begin to rotate it in a clockwise direction. Clockwise. Okay, and then very slowly, continuing in a clockwise direction, Bring it down to your chest. You may have to flip your wrist a little. What direction is it going in? Counterclockwise. Nothing changed about the way you were moving your finger. What changed is your perception. And if you didn't get this, I'm around later. So we sought to develop a, a naturalistic model of worldview transformation. And essentially, this is the model, and I'm going to unpack this step by step. So if you can't see it in the back, not to worry. What we saw as the initial aspects of this, sorry, this is, uh, here we go, was the primary catalyst came from some direct personal experience. It didn't come from out there. It came from what Edgar Mitchell was describing as that shift where we can begin to bring our awareness to what's happening inside us. And what we found is that the vast majority of these experiences came out of pain. They came out of some kind of suffering. It was the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, um, some kind of catastrophic event that was going on, like the loss of your livelihood or your house and the fires in Santa Rosa, for example. Very traumatic experiences. And it makes sense that these traumas can be catalytic because it causes us, it forces us to reflect on what's working and what's not working in our lives. The challenge of these what I'll call noetic experiences is that we can often ignore them. They can be very subtle within our consciousness. This is the definition of noetic that comes from the philosopher and psychologist William James. And he talks about these noetic experiences as states of insight, unplumbed by the discursive intellect. So they're insights, and they're not rational logical. So states of insight, unplumbed by the discursive intellect. They are illuminations, revelations, full of significance and importance, all inarticulate, though they remain, as a rule, uh, 
something that carries with them a curious sense of authority. So these noetic experiences come to us. Maybe it's in a meditation. Maybe it's in an out-of-body experience. Maybe it's in a near-death experience. Something that comes to us and that is very difficult to explain. And so we wanted to understand how these kind of revelatory moments, many of them painful, many of them not, you could describe Edgar Mitchell's experience as something that was both uh, an aspect of his own personal suffering and his sense of joy and epiphany. So out of these noetic experiences, people have the capacity to ignore them. And this is one of the pitfalls of uh, how we can invite in these transformative experiences. So these are barriers that limit us from experiencing the, the positive that can come. And we know that our egos fight mightily to resist new ideas, new framing of who we are. We are uh, very resistant to change. And overall, the ego labors mightily to create and maintain coherence and vigorously defends against dissident stimuli. So this can be a deep challenge for any of us who are trying to make a worldview change. We want it, but yet we resist it. If information confirms our values, we're more open-minded, and if not, we reject them. And so you can imagine going back to this dichotomy of the positive and the negative aspects of worldview transformation and think if you're brought up to believe that there's a certain way in which we should engage reality, we know that we may be less likely to accept the alternative perspective. Scientists have shown that the brain will take in information that conforms to our hypotheses and rejects that which doesn't. So this is a pretty interesting experience, and particularly this study by Dunbar and Fogelstan looked at scientists, and scientists who had a particular hypothesis that they were particularly invested in, and then invited them to critique alternative points of view. And what they found is that their brains actually lit up in different areas. If the information supported their worldview, the learning center of the brain lit up. If, however, it was in a resistance to their preconceived hypothesis, the air detection center of the brain lit up, and they simply weren't perceiving the information. And this is pretty important to understand if we want to think about how we can grow and change. So when people receive information that is inconsistent, learning does not easily occur. Yeah, let's see here. I'm going to just skip through a couple of things. Okay, so we talk about then these experiences. We talk about how we are able to accommodate these experiences into our worldview. And then we look at what comes next. If we're able to perceive it, if we're able to say, hmm, I'm curious about that. Maybe there's something more I can learn. It leads to this process of seeking. And many of you may be in, involved in that stage of your own development, wanting to know more, wanting to learn from trusted teachers who can take us into uh, an environment and have been down the path before us. The problem with the seeking phase is it can lead us to continual seeking. It can lead us to skipping steps in our own development. And that's something that we all need to be aware of as we're looking at how we can be the scientists of our own lived experience, how we can invite in these kinds of transformations. So we're all born scientists and we're all empiricists deep down. So another step to this is finding a practice. 100% of the teachers, and I failed to mention, we also did survey studies with 2,000 average householders to see how their experiences matched with the adepts. We wanted to see if there were commonalities across people who really had dropped out and lived in a cave for 10 years compared to people who were just trying to pay their mortgage and get their groceries. And we found that these patterns worked. They were consistent across people who claimed to have this kind of world transformation. And practices were essential for taking us from the seeking phase to the grounding it in something that was sustainable. 
One of the things that we found in transformative practices, and we interviewed people from many different world traditions. You know, we went from a Catholic priest to a Wiccan priestess. And we know from history that those two didn't get along too well in the past. But they had commonalities. And so looking at all of the various practices from the different traditions, we found that there were five key elements that were shared across these traditions. The first was intention. So you come here with an intention. I want to um, have mental hygiene that improves my disposition, that changes my relationships, that allows me to find that sense of peace and harmony and fulfillment. But we know that intention alone isn't enough. And they talk about the road to hell is paved with good intention. How many of us have made a New Year's resolution and then by the end of January don't even remember that we had one? So intention can be complex, and yet it is catalytic. The second, going back to what John was saying last night, is our attention. Is the glass half empty or the glass half full? One of the things we know from transformative practices is, is they help to adjust our awareness. So when you think about a meditative practice, as you think about our ability to shift the focus from the external world to our internal world, this involves an attention-shifting experience. We also know that there's something called inattentional blindness. And this is something that the cognitive neuroscientists have been studying and which involves the opportunity for us to think about how our culture, our situation influences what we see and don't see. So I had an experience being in the Amazon with um, Walter from the Achuar, and we were walk walking through the rainforest, and he became very animated. And he was looking up at the treetops, and here we were in the rainforest, and it was like, well, why are you getting so excited about the trees, Walter? You know, we were a group of people from the north. And it turns out there were holler monkeys jumping from treetop to treetop. Well, in Walter's culture, the howler monkeys represented survival. They re represented food. And he was somebody who had been trained by his culture to see that. Because we, who hadn't been trained, we think about the grocery store, were experiencing inattentional blindness. We simply couldn't see it because it wasn't part of our assumptions. This is a very common experience, and it's one that, as we practice with discipline, we can begin to overcome. The third element is repetition. So just as we're doing the mantras over and over, what we're doing is changing our brains and changing our bodies and changing our reactiveness. And these are very important things. We know that the brain lays down these neural pathways, and they're kind of like grooves in the snow. And if you're driving and your wheels get stuck in the groove, it's very hard to disengage. And so it's likely that we'll continue and persevere in these habits. But how do we develop new habits? We develop them with time, with practice, with repetition. Just like going to the gym and working a muscle group, it's the same thing we're doing with our brains and our bodies. We're changing the neural pathways, and we're experiencing what they call neuroplasticity, the idea that we can rewire our brains in ways that invite in these life-affirming qualities. The fourth quality or fourth, fourth dimension is guidance. All of our teachers reference the importance of finding someone, something, uh, that would help us to navigate a different path. Somebody who's been on the path longer. Somebody who's calibrated the path and can help us to understand that this is the way to train this muscle group. This is the way to, you know, lead to suffering. So let's stay on this path and let's do these practices that will help us. So guidance becomes important, but it's also interesting when we talk to people that it's not only about outer guidance, it's not only about finding someone who will tell us, it's also about finding those noetic qualities within us that are about inner guidance. How do we begin to learn to trust those intuitive aspects of our experience that help us to know when what we're doing is right and when it may be wrong? And ultimately, it's about surrender or acceptance. It's about resisting the struggle, recognizing that the world out there and all of the suffering may not change just because we want it to. 
What can change is our reaction to it. What can change is our behavior in response to it. So that when we're not agitated, we can begin to model for others this sense of peace and well-being. So surrender and acceptance becomes an important part of the process. And it's almost paradoxical when you think about the effort of intention, the assertion of will, within this principle of surrender. I, uh, I have a film that I made called Death Makes Life Possible, and um, I have some clips. Tomorrow I'm doing a workshop, and I'll go into some of these practices and principles a little more fully, and I have some clips of different people, and that was one of those clips. So, okay, we find these practices, and then what's the pitfall there? It's that life can become the practice, and life can become the pillow. And it isn't about taking those principles and that reconditioning of our minds and bodies out into the world and becoming a participant. So this is where we can get stuck in something that because I go to church on Sunday, I have virtue. But on Monday, I'm rude to my coworkers. We want to see here how we can begin to adapt this model to living. Life becomes the practice. We can develop loving kindness and generosity. We can look at the ways in which forgiveness and patience become powerful tools for navigating so that when we're frustrated by the traffic in a busy day, I like to think of road rage as a spiritual practice. And we can think of these little reminders that people put on their, their dashboard, the bobble-headed Buddha, for example. Um, that provides an opportunity for us to remember because it's very easy to forget. So life as practice becomes something that helps when we have reminders. Brother David Stendelrest was one of the people that we interviewed, and he talked about having gone to Africa and experienced fresh drinking water. And um, he went back to New York to his apartment. He's a Benedictine monk, and he turned on the tap. And he thought, wow, I'm so grateful, because gratefulness meditation is his practice. And then after a couple of days, he discovered he was turning on the water, taking a drink, and not noticing it. So he put these little yellow stickums all over his apartment so that he'd remember. And then when he started habituating to the yellow stickums, he would move them around so that, again, it would remind him. So life becomes the practice, as Sharon Salzberg has said. She was one of the teachers we interviewed. If we remember that our spiritual life is not just for ourselves alone and our own private satisfaction, but it's about how we live every day, how we relate to our children, how we relate to our parents, how we earn a living, how we speak to one another. So life becomes the practice and the spiritual process becomes something that is imbuing every moment of every day. One of the things that we see is that in these in this process of practice, it can often be about me. And the practice is my practice, my work, my discipline. And yet we see that a goal, an essential goal, and the sort of principle of the seminar is that it's about a movement from the me to the we. How is it that we engage in that unit of consciousness that allows us to be responsible, not only for ourselves, but for every living creature? And this becomes an essential part of the transformative practice. But again, they're pitfalls. So one of the things we find is that people who are engaged often forget to take care of the me. We can become, you know, many nurses uh, talk about the, um, the burnout that comes from compassion. Or we find that caretakers have a serious challenge when they're giving, 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 and finding themselves exhausted. So oftentimes the the... The problem for people is not engaging in the self-care because there's this assumption that that's selfish or greedy somehow. So we need to find that balance between the I and the we that will carry us forward in ways that are ultimately transformative. And then we look at the ways in which, let's see, out of this becomes this principle of living deeply. How is it that our lives change, that we respect and appreciate 
everything about the challenges and the opportunities. And how is it that we can take something like a dandelion growing out of a concrete slab and see the beauty and the grace that comes from that? And so this becomes the opportunity for living deeply. It's also engaging our aging. How is it that we live in a culture that is bombarding us with symbols of youth? And then the people who are growing older, the elders of our community, are often left in the shadows. How is it that we can find ways to shift our perspective on that? The same with death. How is it that we can come to embrace our own mortality and recognize that a huge part of our human suffering comes from our resistance to our own mortality? And so as we can make peace with this mortality, as we can make peace with the inevitability of that transition, we can ultimately move from what is considered to be death terror to death awareness and acceptance. And in that process, we find that people are happier, healthier, and better citizens. They give more. So this is the, the project on Death Makes Life Possible. I did this in partnership with Deepak Chopra, um, and it came out a couple years ago. Ernest Becker, who wrote The Denial of Death, won a Pulitzer. The irony of man's condition is that the deepest need is to be free of the anxiety of death and annihilation but it is life itself which awakens it, and so we must shrink from being fully alive. So as we engage in positive worldview transformation, as we think about the catalysts that bring us to a fuller sense of being, we know that this is a vitally important component. This is just another cartoon. Is this somebody's idea of a joke? And they're pointing out that you are here, which is just in the brain. And what we know is that who we are is fundamentally more and more inclusive. OK. All right, and then bringing this into community. So this is the final stage of the transformative model and very much part of what we're discussing here, which is that we're working with ourselves, we're working with one another. We can see that it is in some ways like a fractal. Uh, we can see it's sort of a Fibonacci spiral and that it's iterative. So as we think about our own journey, we think about how we take this out into the world. How does inner peace lead to outer peace? And how can we bring this out to promote this idea of a collective transformation? I think there's a wire loose or something. So my own work in doing this has taken a variety of steps since we finished the study. Uh, one is looking at healers and the process of organized medicine. I work uh, with Kaiser Permanente and looking at how we can help the doctors and the nurses to replenish themselves, how we can look at this alleviation of suffering, not only with the patients, but also within the context of the organized healthcare system. We created a curriculum around this transformative model called Worldview Explorations, WE, where we're working with young people to help them understand that they have this worldview and where that comes from, how we can pay attention to it, that other people have different worldviews from ourselves, and that through nonviolent communication, through compassionate listening, we can begin to develop empathy and a sense of rapprochement with people who are different from ourselves. And this is a fundamental challenge, I think, for the 21st century. Science, and really looking at the ways in which science has had this kind of limited view, and that over time, that model of reality has shifted and changed from you know, the idea of the Earth-centered universe to a Sun-centered universe to an expanding universe. All of these are testable hypotheses over time. So Willis Harman was uh, one of the early presidents of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. He wrote, no economic, political, or military power can compare with the power of a change of mind. By deliberately changing their images of reality, people are changing the world. And so what you're doing here by participating in the Sangha, by participating in the support of one another, by cooking the meals, cleaning the plates, 
um, by working together with a sense of love and kindness, we are incrementally helping to change the world. So today I'm working at Sophia University. I work at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, looking at the ways in which we can engage this broader sense of health and wellness. Uh, rather than pathologizing these kind of experiences, how can we begin to de develop and nurture this transpersonal dimension of ourselves? And ultimately, my next project is looking at virtual reality and inviting in these kind of transpersonal and noetic experiences so that people can have a moment of engagement. And in particular, right now, I'm working on aging and aging reversal. So how do we help people who, through this virtual reality, process can experience themselves with health and ease and um, less pain, less suffering. And we'll see what happens. It's an empirical uh, test and we are starting it like in the next week or two. So this is an example of how this change model and the sort of Fibonacci spiral exists in nature. This was from a baby pumpkin in my garden. This is the garden, and we are at a tipping point. It is an opportunity for all of us. I thank you so much for taking your time to come and be in this kind of practice, in this kind of community, and ultimately to take it out into the world with you because we are all harbingers of something new. Uh, we like to say that we are in many ways like uh, hospice workers for a dying paradigm and midwives for something new that's waiting to be born. And this is my contact information. I thank you for your time and your attention. <laughs>